guess I'll try it this way, Bill. <laughs> Thank you, Nancy. Um, well, well um, let's see. Okay. Yeah, a little better. That's fine. That's good enough for me. Well, I can see better. <laughs> I guess you're trying to see that, aren't you? Do you see that? All right. Um, <laughs> Well, today I'm going to be political, but not partisan, spiritual, but not sectarian. We're going to talk about community and trying to build community. I think we all know, we are, you know, we're all suffering from all the same painful divisions, whether it's in the nation or El Dorado County. It's just been a real hard time. I've got a, a, a weird ability. Uh, to be able to carry water back and forth across the green line. <laughs> well, I was laughing, he knows. Um, so anyway, it's, you know, I can be in the Sierra Club, and then I can go to a tea party meeting, and then I can go to parents and friends of lesbians and gays, and then go to a Republican Central Committee meeting. And I have no cognitive dissonance, you know, and, and so if David can do it, I suppose anyone can do it, right? Uh, yeah, one of my veteran friends said that, uh, David, there's all these veteran groups and they're all mad at each other and the only one that gets along with all of them is you. So, uh, anyway, I, I get in trouble too. But, uh, all right, so the word community is to be one with, and, uh, yeah, I guess we can move on to the next one, Bill. Let's see where we are. Yeah, and a feeling of fellowship with others as a result of sharing common attitudes, interests, and goals. Now, the problem is, there's an opportunity in there, but there's also a danger. So when I thought of this word, I, mean, I was thinking globally, and how we should all love each other. But when you look at that, and it says, okay, my community is the people that have something in common with. And so people start saying, well, I have something in common with the people that look like me, but not those other people. Or I have people of these values, but not those values. And so I see both an opportunity and a danger in there. And it's, so it's trying to find a way to, to bridge those differences and expand what our community can look like. And uh, I have to admit, to some extent, uh, I'm only going to get so far, but at least I'll try and at least include our country, whole country in this by the time I'm done. Um, and I say the key is to remain in relationship. Uh, people are, I'm just always so sad when people are breaking up relationships, um, you know, because of some Facebook post or something else like that. And so the key is to stay in relationship, hang in there. Well, part of the discipline of staying in relationship, uh, one of the great things about living in Placerville is that discipline. And I was remembering just when we first came to town, I think we were probably eating a tortilla flats or something. <laughs> My wife says, yeah, probably. Uh, no, I don't think of that as in the county. <laughs> but it's just a discipline. You can't be talking smack about somebody when you're eating in a restaurant in Placerville because their uncle is three booths over and they're going to hear it, right? <laughs> and so it teaches you a discipline. You start to internalize not saying bad things about other people because you'll be the one smacked <laughs> real quick. And, and you know, when I was growing up in the Bay Area, everything was a little bit more of a bubble. And it was a little safer to, to have some smack talk because you were anonymous. No one knew who you were. But here, we're all famous just to each other. You know? So, uh, let's see what the next one says. Okay, communism. I'm going to give a big shout out for communism. Um, and this is going to be kind of strange, but especially for a Republican. But anyway, um, one of the books I'm going to be talking about is a foundational book, and it is the Bible. This is not preaching at you, but it's just trying to help you see how deep some of these roots and origins are. So in the book of Acts, um, uh, basically, one of the same, uh, one of the verses, uh, 
couple of verses. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. And so Christian communists, and there's a little cognitive dissonance there, but they're not necessarily Marxist or Christian communists. They think that Marx and Engels and people like that got their ideas from the Book of Acts, from this concept. Um, and so, uh, you know, this is after Jesus is gone. Uh, today's the day, it's Good Friday, he's leaving now. So, um, uh, but, but those who were left basically formed a, a start off with communism. And I've participated in a couple forms of communism and, and, and I've enjoyed it, so I'll, I'll share them with you. Um, one is I'm an associate of a monastic order, uh, the Order of Julian of Norwich. Let's see, Bill, should we move along? There we go. Um, and some of big monasticism means that you live in a community. Um, I obviously don't live in a monastery. I've been in monasteries, but I don't live in one. Um, but the, um, there's a lot of monasteries are, are very cleverly marketed, and so uh, there's various ways you can participate. Uh, so there's the members regular who live in the monastery. There are oblates who take on extra obligations. And then there's associates who are card-carrying members, but maybe they're, uh, they don't have to do as much. Um, and I can assure you that during a time of a pandemic, uh, when you're not supposed to do anything or go anywhere, it's kind of nice to participate in, in a monastic order. You've got something to do at regular times of the day. Uh, I'll spill those times. And so it, it has to do with living community according to a shared rule. Uh, Julian of Norwich, I should, where are we here? Oh, I'll we'll leave it there. Um, Julian of Norwich was the first woman to write a book in English. Um, and, and so that was very interesting to me. Uh, she also, well, they just changed it, but part of the attraction for me for that particular order was both men and women were members of it. Uh, anyway, men and women being such as they are, they now decide they're just going to be women. <laughs> but that was a recent change. Uh, the rule of Benedict, and I recommend, I'll, I'll be talking to you about another group in South County. Um, well, and I recommended the rule of Benedict for them to study. Uh, it had nothing to do with the, their religious beliefs, but just the rule of Benedict is something that's worked for, you know, a thousand years or whatever, um, as a way of organizing a community. Most intentional communities in America blow up after one generation, or when they drink the Kool-Aid, or whatever happens. Um, so, but sometimes it can last for multi-generations, for a thousand years or more. And so this particular order tries to use the rules of, um, the rule of Benedict, and there's two basic things. One is to achieve stability. And as I said, that whole falling apart thing, that chaos, uh, is sort of built into human beings. But stability is foundational, and the vows are the foundation of that. And so many of us have taken vows. We all of us have vowed to protect the Constitution. I think I had to take a vow when I got a job at UC Berkeley in the Social Welfare Library. I had to vow to protect the Constitution, and I was just in shock. I think I had to say, I don't believe in communism, too, at the same time, and all sorts of things. And that's so I could get my minimum wage job. Um, so you may have taken vows in a marriage, or if you're a church in some way. Uh, there's all kinds of ways of taking vows, but those could be foundational. And then they um, want you to change your life. We call it conversion of life. We still got popular good. Some of the words I'm going to use, I'm going to try and give you a different way of feeling or thinking about these words. Poverty. Poverty has to do with not being attached to your goods. This doesn't mean you're going to live in the dirt. You don't have to automatically be homeless. Um, but it has to do with non-attachment. And the best thing about that is to slow down the reaction time. 
re we'll be talking about reactivity, and that'll come up again. But reactivity is what gets us in trouble so much, and that attachment to our possessions, to our goods, um, can get us in a lot of trouble. Uh, let me throw a little Sierra Club thing in here. Uh, I'll be writing a little thought piece, if they, if they, maybe they'll publish it, sometimes they publish my writings, um, and it'll be about non-attachment to goods. And the idea is to be a good backpacker, you know, take only a picture, leave only a footprint. And the size of our homes has doubled since we were born. You know, the same number of people, twice as much space. And a lot of that has storage for all the goods. And so we can reduce our, if we want to do our carbon footprint thing, whatever, we can reduce it just by having fewer things and less attachment to those goods. So that's, that's just one thing there. Um, well, that, that'll be enough on that. All right, how about chastity? There we go. Uh, chastity, so, you know, some giggling there, but it, it's, it's, not, it's not actually about sexuality. I mean, to the extent it has to do with sex, it's not turning the other person into a sex object, but what it's really about is not objectifying other people. So when you see another person, for example, I don't like talking about the homeless. That's like saying they are that and they're stuck in the box now. Each homeless person is an infinite universe of various possibilities. And so, um, you know, we were just talking about what to do about the homeless and, and there's, you need a whole lot of different instruments and tools because each person needs a customized, unique response to help them get through it. Um, and so every human being um, is not a thing, not an object, but sort of an infinite uh, possibility. I, I say that each person is an icon through whom you can see the holy. And so as we try and build up community, uh, slowing down our reaction time, and being prepared to be surprised by how deep and complex that person is, you thought was a thing, they become a whole person, uh, that can really help. How about prayer? Thanks, Phil. I'm going to cheat sheet up here, too. So, apathetic prayer is an emptying out prayer. Uh, there's uh, cataphatic, which is words, and apathetic, which is emptying out. Uh, you can think of it as meditation, centering prayer. You maybe have heard these words before. The um, I'm going to tell you a little story about uh, apathetic prayer. I was doing uh, Lectio Divina, which is a kind of centering meditative prayer. I'll back up a little bit. So I was called, uh, every now and then, people would stipulate to have me be like a referee or uh, a traffic cop uh, for various litigation matters. And the objective, you know, the, the tip of the iceberg, so to speak, the objective reason for picking me was because there was an accounting problem. And so maybe David can do the, you know, and I, and, um, uh, my life experience with people and financial uh, uh, goes like this. Every financial problem is a reflection, or, no, every financial choice is a reflection of personality and feelings. The brain is the last organ consulted and the one most heavily discounted. So, so it's, it is with that approach that I would say, okay, you want me to objectively account for this problem. So in this one case, there were lots of parties, lots of people fighting with everybody, and there was one particular set, that were, I'll call them the designated perpetrators. And, uh, and so I was supposed to do an accounting and figure out how they were designated perpetrators. But anyway, I'm, so I'm doing this little meditative prayer, and it's like a freight train is coming inside of my brain and explodes, and it says, they said they were Christians. <laughs> so, so I phone up the attorney who represents them, who's a dear, sweet person, 
and I said, um, your client said that they said that they're Christians. How about we go out to lunch and discuss this with them? And so we did, and we talked about letting go and not being attached to things and slowing down the reaction time. And at the end of it, they felt like they had been really respected, that they had really been seen for who they were, that they really were Christians. And at that point, they let go of everything, and all the pieces came into place, and uh, Judge Proud was the judge there. <laughs> and everything um, uh, fell into place, and it was like a miracle, and it all went away, and everybody could stop building their clients, and it was over. <laughs> So sometimes apathetic prayer is a helpful thing. Um, oh, I, well, yeah, so anyway, it helped kill time. Uh, and the cataphetic part, uh, I, my goal is to do my prayers five times per day. Uh, sometimes the noonday prayer shows up around nine o'clock. But <laughs> uh, so you gotta be a little bit flexible. But it, it's a great way to fill the time and help you practice it. A little better behavior. Let's see now. Where am I? Five times. I, I think I'm going to talk to you for a second about um, slowing down that reaction time and applying that to this monasticism. Uh, uh, Steve Schwarzbach, you're going to get your story eventually at the end here. But, um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, a lot of my volunteer work now has to do with veterans and criminal justice and things like that. So this very sweet man, he was a good man, uh, and you can tell he's a good man because he's in the honor camp at Jamestown. He was a state prisoner, but you know, honor camp. But he couldn't control his impulse. So he wandered off where he wasn't supposed to go, and now he you know, is technically an escape. I don't think it was hard to catch him, but you know, now he's escaped. And he comes in, comes into Plasville Jail so they can process him and chance him to state prison. So I went in to visit with him. And uh, I said to him, you know, sometimes I thought, what would I be doing? You know, how would I try to approach this if I was, you know, in the same situation you're in? And I said, you know, here it is. You've got your cell your monastic cell, and you have your built-in community, and you know, and you get out your Bible and your prayer book and your prayer life, and you, you know, you do your prayers and you pray for everyone else. And he looks at me and he says, that is a tremendous way to frame it. And so hopefully it's helping him. <laughs> hopefully he'll get out soon. All right, another communist experience. Uh, when I was a teenager, uh, I think I just started dating Connie, but you know, so I, I still, I don't think it was 19 yet, but I lived on Kibbutz Machanayim, and that's in Israel, it's right under the Golan Heights. And uh, I was a guest worker. Um, wait, wait, move along, man. Oh, geez, I forgot obedience. All right. <laughs> Let's go back to obedience. Um, uh, it comes from Obadira, and it means to listen to or to pay attention to. So obedience sounds like, you know, you're an automaton, you're just supposed to do what you're told to do. It actually means to really listen, to really hear the other person, um, to, and to reflect and think about it. You, it might deflect what direction you're going if you really take into consideration what the other person's saying. I think that when I l listened to that little freight train, and they, and that was uh, supposed to be an illustration of obedience also, because I really listened to what was being said. All right, now what's the next one say? <laughs> there I am. Okay, but now I'm thinking it's my canine. Thanks. Um, you know, when you pick apples all day and you're trying to fall asleep and you close your eyes, all you can see is apples. <laughs> so I learned that on Kibbutz Machanayim. But the thing that really struck me was watching the kids play. Now, at that time, I think they've changed how they raise the kids now, but at that time, who are we talking about? Gosh, that was 50 years ago or more than 50 years ago. 
home. Um, so at that time, the kids were more raised in common. Um, there'd be like a, a central place where they slept and people would be in charge of doing a lot of, I mean, they knew who their parents were, but, so I remember growing up as a kid and playing. And the conversation would be, my ball, my rules. Or, you lost. No, I didn't. You cheated. Do you remember any of these games at the playground? Thank you, Bill. <laughs> so, um, there was none of that. I would watch these kids play, and it was so natural. They just played. There was no arguing. There was no fighting. They just played. I said, wow. I wish I could have played like that, you know. So, anyway, there were some good things about that communist society, too. Let me move along the next one. Yeah, there we go. Um, this is a, we have many homeless camps, recovery facilities, whatever, in the Western Slope. I, I, I think uh, Lenny Boyce and I one time came up with about a dozen on the Western Slope, and they all have different rules, different ways of doing things. Um, Coca-Pelli Ranch has a program called Recovery in Action. They're somewhere in South County. I actually never went to go see them, although they came to see me very often, which was great. Um, but their main specialty is helping parents who are losing, maybe losing custody of their kids to reunify with their kids with an alcohol program. And, but but they, they're a community of multi-generational, um, and they all started with being, need to be recovering from their alcoholism. And they use a variety of techniques, including shamanism, sweat lodge, they, you want to pet a pig, they've got one, um, you know, raising your food, things like that. They have a very high success rate. So we do have various, uh, opportunities to experience communism here. Now, I want to be clear that when I talk about communism, it's in this more pure form. I mean, we're not talking about Mao or Putin or Xi or Stalin or any of that. That's, we'll, we'll get into that soon. But anyways, this is something pure. Uh, okay, how about the next one? There we go. So, Bible fans, uh, in case you were worried about the Bible's all about communism, uh, there's another opportunity. Uh, there's a, a Jesus is very strong on capitalism in this particular one. Um, before you get to this part, he's praising uh, all these great capitalists who took, you know, the, the, the boss man went away, they, he trusted some capital with them, and they did great investing their money, and uh, good for them. And this one knucklehead uh, doesn't invest his capital. He buries it in the ground. He's afraid. He's afraid of investing. He's afraid of what might happen. And so then he gets chewed out. Well, at least he could have taken it over the elder round savings and got some interest or something, you know. So uh, there is a, a, a basis for that, too. There's a philosopher, uh, Sun Simeon, and in a way it's the opposite of Marxism. So um, I think in the Communist Manifesto probably says to each according to his ability. You know, from each according to his ability, to each according to his Need and Sam Simon does the opposite. It's from each according to his need and to each according to his ability. So there's different ways of looking at this. And you can always find whatever you want in the Bible if you want to justify what you're doing. All right. Um, I think it's time for. Oh, I forgot. Yes. Um, yeah, you know what's going to happen. You're going to be so good. Um, so what we're going to do is have some silliness breaks so that I, you know, as I break up your stupor for not having listened to me for a little bit. And, and Carolyn is going to, what, you going to do your clackers? Wake up. Wake up. There we go. All right. Now, I, I'm going to have to put, I mean, uh, all right. everybody, make a circle like this. It doesn't make anything bad. Okay. <laughs> make a circle like this. Now, push it against your forehead as hard as you can. Everyone, push it. Push it as hard as you can now. Poke your head through the hole. Do your best. Now poke your head through the hole. Anyone, can, can anyone do it? Can you do it? Yes! Stand up. Show them how it's done. Yes! <laughs> Drew, it will take some community to poke your head through the hole. <laughs> All right, enough of that silliness. And 
until the next time. All right. All right, don't put another one out. Uh, populism. So, um, we're going to go through some of the challenges, some of the things that are, I, I would say, anti-community. Populism. It's inherently divisive. Uh, it doesn't work unless you have someone to be opposed to. So, uh, people versus the elite, us versus them. It, it could be either right wing or left wing. It's just you've got to figure out who the bad guys are. And, 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 you know. So, you might be against the feet snobs or the coastal elites. If you're in Britain, you're against London. You could be against billionaires or foreigners. People are different or a threat to the majority. So, oh, I got them all pretty quickly. So, populism is, uh, I consider it to be a threat to community. Uh, you can see they're trying to build a community, but it's at the expense, you know, you're, you're defining it by negatives. You know, we're not one of them, they're not one of us. All right, the word autocracy. All right, The Economist is my favorite magazine these days, um, and I believe everything it says. So, and I was shocked. Um, they said, oh, this is terrible. This autocracy is going to turn into a dictatorship. And I'm thinking, what's the difference? I mean, either way, the guy's going to throw acid in your face. I mean, what's the difference? And apparently there's differences. So we're going to go through various kinds of bad things that we don't want to have in our country, but they're slightly different. So an autocracy is a system it's actually a system with one head of government. Now, you know, Plato's Republic, the philosopher king. So it could, you know, it could make a sound of mine. Um, a hereditary ruler, a tribal elder, a bishop, or the head of the Chinese Communist Party. But there's some kind of system. There's one, one guy in charge who never knows who that is. And it's Jake and Fear. So let's go on to the next one. Now, a dictatorship is arbitrary one-man rule. So there's some sort of system and some sort of, you know, like the communists are going to have their big meeting and whatever. A dictatorship, I guess, in some ways worse than autocracy because there's no one, there's no confabs. He just tells you what to do. He wakes up one morning and says, everyone's going to wear pink and you're wearing pink, you know, or whatever. How about another one? So uh, we're going to deal with tyranny more than once, but uh, right now we'll say it's all about the ruler, not the common good. So he doesn't care if you're starving or not. Uh, Tyrant says, as long as I've got mine, I don't care if you get yours or not. That's your problem. All right. Next. So uh, I use North totalitarianism controlling all aspects of your life. Think COVID zero policy in Shanghai. They don't even have potable water now. You want to get outside of, there's a camera outside of your door, and if you want to try to get outside, someone will pound on you. That's totalitarianism. They also might know every single tap you're making on your computer. So. So it can get worse than dictatorship. <laughs> All right, uh, authoritarianism. You might have some freedom, but no political accountability. Maybe Putin's Russia, they're not efficient enough to be totalitarian, so you have some freedom, uh, but he's not accountable to anybody. Fascism. Uh, so, you know, Hitler, Mussolini, whatever, racist or nationalistic myth. The nation must be reborn to be pure. So again, this is divisive. You know, who, the person standing up here isn't going to be part of your purity group. Uh, so, uh, it's, it's another form of autocracy, but they use fascism to justify it. All right, a little more gentle, oligarchy. Ruled by a few, aristocracy. Uh, plutocracy could be a, a form of uh, oligarchy, you know, rule of the rich and 
instead of just the nobles. All right, we're going to democracy. Now, we have some examples of democracy in the United States. Uh, New England's kind of famous for their town hall meetings. You know, 20 people show up in the, in the town hall and they vote 14 to 6. Garbage is picked up on Tuesday now instead of Thursday. That's a democracy. All right. And demos, that means the people. So the people are the rulers. And a republic. So race is a thing, R-E-S, and publica, so it's a, a public thing, matter, concern. Originally, it was any form of government other than tyranny. But now we mean by democratically elected representatives, but the people still hold ultimate sovereign authority. So, you know, so if I vote for a state senator, um, you know, that person's my representative, but I can vote them out or do a recall or something. All right. I think we live in a republic now. I'm going to give a kind of a shout out for anarchism. Um, having, having told you all the virtues of communism, uh, I'll try this to some extent of anarchism. Oh, sorry, no. thanks. Um, I'll give you some examples of where you might have some sympathy for anarchism, and then I'm going to give you some examples of why, no, you don't want anarchism. So, the, you understand that anarchism is trying to live without any government at all, but it's the belief that people are good. People are good, and they only do bad things because the government made them do it. So I'm going to give you some examples. Um, every now and then you might cry today, so you bear with me. Uh, this young man fought in Iraq. He was ordered to break the windshield of an Iraqi's truck, and he followed his orders. He cannot forgive himself. He suffered what is called moral injury. Moral injury is the cognitive dissonance between who you think you are and what you've done. He suffered moral injury. He tried his best to pull it back. He testified before Congress. He formed veteran, a veteran's group that was opposed to the war. But he didn't make it. I told you I was going to cry a couple of times. <laughs> so, um, eventually, uh, Lance Poinson, who was the veteran service officer over in Elder Rock County, and I were interviewed by the news and because he did commit suicide and it became a news story. Anyway. So, remember, it's back in Israel. Uh, I wasn't on the kibbutz at this moment, I was somewhere in a pub or a cafe, and an Israeli soldier comes up to me, and I think he wanted an absolution. Uh, boy, it must have been right after the Six Day War. So he had fought on the Golanites, and he had prisoners, and he was taking them back, and he gets an order. We got a crisis on the front here in the Golden Heights. By the way, Mark and I are right up the kibbutz on them. It's right underneath the Golden Heights. I'm sure it got shelled. You know, they had to have the Golden Heights uh, so they could be safe. We got a crisis here. You got to come back right now in Egypt. What do I do about my prisoners? I really want, I'm a teenager, right? I really want me to give him absolution. And all I could do is just listen with a slack jaw. And he also had moral injury. One more. Medics are my heroes. 
7. When you're about to in a battle and there's a big kaboom, big explosion, everyone's running away from the big boom, the big explosion. You set up a minute. They have to run to it. They have to fight every impulse in their body and run to it. This lady, she never committed any crimes as a civilian. She's a very sweet person. But she self-medicated her trauma with alcohol. Post-traumatic stress is what every good and kind person suffers from when they have trauma. The only people who do not have post-traumatic stress from a traumatic experience are sociopaths who did, never cared in the first place. And then you can have compassion for them because they have attachment disorder and something didn't go well in that system. So, she treated by alcohol. More than once I tried to get her to get in my car and go to Mather and get detoxed and go into recovery. Nothing, so I keep drinking. Uh, we have the homeless outreach team uh, in Placerville. They do a great job. Uh, there's always at least one female on the homeless outreach team. She was fighting, she found this lady in the Hangtown Motel. Uh, and by the way, the Sheriff's Department and the City Police do a great job of collaboration. Fantastic. Um, it's even though it's the city's jurisdiction, you know, our city, a city police officer assigned to the homeless outreach team, but we have more than our sheriff homeless right in the city of Placerville, so the Sheriff's Department helps with these issues. So the female uh, homeless outreach deputy founder. We had to put together an action plan. The lady had congestive heart failure. Um, one of the veterans commissioners, a uh, retired a veteran, I'm pretty sure he's a combat veteran, retired Amador County deputy sheriff, wanted to jump on this and save her life. That's good. But he didn't want to drive the female by himself because he felt that was good. Uh, he didn't want to get in trouble. So one of the male deputies came off duty with the sergeant's, I mean, on the duty was his time off with the sergeant's permission, road two, rode the car two. They got her to Mather emergency room. That's when she had her heart attack. And they saved her life. Now, I was recently honored on Veterans Day by the veterans community, and I thought it was supposed to just say thank you, you know. But uh, the lovely Veteran of the Year had a funny speech and went on and on, and I thought, uh oh, maybe I was supposed to make a speech. So I'm trying to think. And uh, Gary Campbell, who was the MC, turns around and looks at me as I come up and says, Make it short. <laughs> I said, all right, I can do this. So this was my speech. We're all going to die. When you save a life, it's only for the moment. Do it anyway. So, unfortunately, this lady uh, discharged herself prematurely from Marshall Hospital right before Christmas and died the next day. It was against doctor's orders. And when I made that speech, she was still alive, but next to me was the deputy who got honored with me and the hot team and the other you know, social worker at Mather and everyone who did everything they could to save her life. We had everything in place. And one of the lessons of well, C.S. Lewis has a great saying, the gates of hell are locked from the inside and the inmates have the keys. I'm always giving out that get out of the hell card. No, I like hell. It's nice and warm in here. You know, and uh, so she was given her get out of the hell card. We had her, got her detox. We had 
a bed ready at a residential recovery facility. When she was done for that, with that, she could live for the rest of her life in a state of California veterans home. She was never gonna have to worry about anything again. We have everything, nope, just take me back to the motel and I lost her ticket again. So anyway, these are lives that were ruined because they follow government orders. However, I'll give you a few examples of why we still need government. So there's only, I've dealt with hundreds of veterans who were incarcerated, but there's only three that I can, well actually one of them wasn't a veteran, but that's misidentification. Um, so only uh, three of them I felt absolutely had, to, we the people need to be protected from them. Uh, one, Nice man, a lot of good value, virtues and values. He was psychotic, and he needed a dog to tell him if what he was seeing or hearing was real. Those dogs didn't last long. They used to live for about a year with him, and then he, they died. But he could not turn off the violence. I thought he was good with one guy. He stabbed a guy, and that, the victim went to state prison. That actually ended up being a happy ending, but that's another story for another time. Um, and this guy graduated from Veterans Court. He could not turn it off. He still wanted to kill him. And so he eventually went to state prison, I think in Kern County, and died of COVID. But there's, you know, that, that psychosis was such, even with big meds, he wasn't going to stop being violent. You know what, it's not even a little bit later in my show. Thanks, Bill. I'll, I'll stop those stories. All right. Um, progressivism, purification. This is not progressivism as we talk about it today. I'm talking about 110, 120 years ago, Woodrow Wilson's time. So, progressivism, uh, I was very shocked that it has so much to do with purification. And they wanted to remove the power from the corrupt politicians, and the voters are all idiots too, and place power in the hands of experts. They had a passion for efficiency, they could be anti democratic, and they saw the people as ignorant. Oh, almost time for silliness. Almost time for silliness. Yeah, you're good, you're good. Um, and From, you know, some of you have maybe heard of the administrative state. Um, this is where it comes from. I'm, I'm, all right, I'm going to try to do this as fast as I can. Well, the American Legion was having a problem because we're running from the, to the Tea Party and someone was objecting. And so I found out our local Tea Party was a real 501c3, so they weren't this kind of political Tea Party thing. So I went to visit them, and suddenly they had an open mic, and as you can tell, they like microphones. And so I said whatever I wanted there, um, and I had a good time. And even uh, I even got to visit a staffer back in Washington, one of Warren Hatch's staffers, and uh, found out, you know, talked about the tax status of the Tea Party and stuff. Um, and they had a state of Jefferson table, and that made me happy because when I was a kid growing up, Stanton Delaplane was a columnist in the Chronicle, and he's one of the inventors of the state of Jefferson. You knew that? <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I had a good time with the state of Jefferson people, and I worked on a constitution based on North Dakota for them. And I was kind of surprised. You know, the thing is a conservative state, but there was something in it uh, that just, actually this is in the law codes. We're gonna talk about this in a minute. Well, we have been talking about it. Remember how evil the executive authority is? We're thinking about Putin and now, and you don't want those dictators running your life. And so, when we get the Constitution, we'll be talking about the separation of powers. But what I found was and this is sort of based on progressivism, that they wanted the experts. And so what they did is, let's have administrative law judges instead of the judicial branch judges hearing these cases because they might know more about that 
a vast and executive branch taking over a lot of the judiciary. We're going to have rules and regulations, but they're going to be written by the executive branch. So most of the laws that we live under have been written by the executive branch instead of the legislature. And so for me, the danger is you're getting too much power in the executive, and we don't want to have any Vladimir Putins running the United States. All right, so I'll stop that and Karen, wake them up. So, let's pretend today's Saturday, and um, I put on my shoes. It was the first time I put on my shoes in three days. When did I last put on my shoes? Today. Saturday. Oh, gosh, I didn't get that answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, Carol, are you satisfied with that answer? Uh, I'm not sure. <laughs> Any other answers? <laughs> I don't know, I was kind of thinking maybe it could be Wednesday, let's see, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, first time in three days, maybe Wednesday, last time I put on my shoes. Anyway, I don't care. Saturday. Saturday? Yeah. Saturday. That's what I did. Okay, thank you, Carolyn. All right, so enough of that so this Don't give me another slide. All right, we'll go through these words as fast as possible. It took longer than I thought of it. Respect is to really see someone for who they are. Remember that um, I was talking about chastity, really seeing someone for who they are. Spect as in spectacles. All right, let's go for another one. Humility is to be from the humus, the living part of the soil, to be a man of the earth, so to speak, is to be in touch with the roots. Um, and slowly with a life of firm sense. These are virtues you want to take on, and so when you look at someone else, or you're dealing with someone else, and they're testing you off, try to, try to have humility and respect. Okay, huh? Reconciliation to the silly of the eyes. So you're so, you're so, seeing so to each other so closely together, you're so eye to eye, that you're silly of your eyelashes are getting enmeshed. And that's what reconciliation is about, all right? I found this fascinating. Justice is doing the right thing in public, and righteousness is doing the right thing in private. I, I know if I'm trying to figure out what the heck is righteousness, but there it is. All right, what, what's next, Bill? All right, liberal. So uh, I think it kind of, as I said, that open mic at the tea party. And uh, so I went up and said, liberal. And I went over the definition. It comes from L-I-B-E-R-E, -E, libera, which means a free person. And means to be a free man. The founder of our local tea party since passed away is a very nice man, Bill Freeman. And I said, see, Bill, you're a liberal. And he said, I know that, David. <laughs> Already, uh, and, and so you can see that word in liberal libertarianism. Quick thing on libertarianism: um, it sounds a lot like anarchism. I often wonder what the difference is. So anarchism, I would say, people are good. That's what they're trying to emphasize, and I think they're a little bit off on that. That's we are mostly good. But uh, libertarianism, the emphasis is that government's bad, but they want it just enough to. Just barely enough. Okay. Um, next one. Well, conservatism, I mean, you know, it's a nice thing. You want to conserve the soil, you want to conserve your resources, you want to conserve whatever's beautiful and virtuous and all that. So classical liberalism is a link and blend, both being conservative and liberal. And I think a lot of our constitution it reflects classical liberalism. All right, next one, Bill. So on the Declaration of Independence, I think I counted because he, 18 times. So what our foundational document is, is an opposition to autocracy. It's really we need to get away from overburdening the executive branch with too much power. Um, so I already mentioned a lot of these things. Okay, yeah, let's go on to the next one. Oh, story time. Actually, you know what, I'll try to do, nah, I don't think I'll do another silly one. We're just gonna, no, we're just gonna do it. 
All right, uh, this is uh, for you, Steve. So, um, how did David get into dealing with all these veterans? I had a client, um, gosh, even back in 1976, and he was the sweetest man on the planet. And being the sweetest man on the planet, stealing money from him was as easy as stealing candy from a baby. So I'm doing his estate plan, and he had a couple older relatives, but there was no human being on the planet that he knew that he could be trusted, who, would, who wouldn't steal from him, who could be trusted. It was the one and only time I put my name down as the third name. Yes, Terry. <laughs> no good deed goes unpunished. In the coral areas, that's how you can tell it's a good deed. So, um, Marshall Hospital calls me up, and of course the other relatives have died, and says, uh, you got the money, honey, I got the time. You ran out of money, I ran out of time. And uh, it's time to put him on the sidewalk with his wheelchair, and David, come and get him. So, fortunately for me, uh, Eschaton uh, Village in Plasville had just opened up, they had plenty of empty rooms, and I could get him in. Uh, and to help pull this together, I had to get his, it was a World War II veteran, so I had to get his aid and attendance benefits. Uh, that was near 1700 a month that we needed to help make ends meet. And so I, and I did everything right. And after a number of years, I, I, a few years, I got a letter from the Veterans Administration. Dear Mr. Zelensky, you failed to report the income from the Columbia West Society, and therefore we have overpaid his benefits and you need to pay back every penny. It was like $100,000, right? And I'm saying, the Columbia West Society? I Googled it. It's a women's roller derby team in Columbia, South Carolina. <laughs> Dear VA, he is not a transvestite roller derby star in Columbia, South Carolina. <laughs> Dear Mr. Zelensky, you are wrong, and we have the 1099 to prove it. Fortunately, the American Legion has an office in Oakland in the same building as the VA in Oakland, where this is going to be adjudicated. Fortunately, the American Legion has an office in the same building in St. Paul, where the benefits come from, uh, as the VA does. Okay. So, I spent about 20 hours putting together all of his income, all of his expenses, you know, and send it off to the American Legion, who walk it upstairs and get in their face, get in the VA's face, and then they send everything off to St. Paul, and the Legion walks upstairs and gets in the VA's face in St. Paul. And finally, I get uh, a message from Stephanie. I will never, a phone call, a phone call from Stephanie. Dear Mr. Zelensky, you are right. He is not a transvestite mother to me, star. <laughs> All right, so that's how I got started with the American Legion. Um, all right, 25 years. Uh, so I'm visiting this veteran. They always love to take off their shirt and show you their bullet, their bullet holes, so I get to see you know, the bullet holes. He had tried to commit death by cop. And so he was running towards the police, shooting his gun up in the air. As a state agent explained to me, David, when it goes up, has to come down. <laughs> so it wasn't quite as safe as he might have thought. And uh, the torso piercing did not kill him. And so finally he was going to have to go to state prison for 25 years. And he says to me, David, the thing that's going to keep me alive, <laughs> do it again, <laughs> terrible, the thing that's going to keep me alive is that I want to someday see my son. I want to get through this and then see my son. So off he goes. Next week, a veteran 
comes in to jail. He's, you know, just to be re just to be processed. He's from state prison, and he says to me, David, the thing that kept me going for 25 years, I just wanted to be with my son. And his son took him back and took him home. Boy, oh. well, I didn't think I was going to cry that much on that one, but uh, one more time. <laughs> so uh, we're walking down the bike trail, and a guy reads the guy's t shirt, and it says, um, you, Nothing scares me, you don't scare me. I've got a teenage daughter. <laughs> So anyway, we, you know, we got four kids at home, and uh, life's not easy. And we got a phone call. This exchange student needs to needs a home, and so we got to look at each other. Well, it can't get any worse, right? So we take him on, and then so we got into the exchange student things. And among the people who were putting on the exchange student program, they take the kids off to Ashland every year, and uh, one of the plays we saw was All My Sons. Now the plot is World War II, and the father owns a munitions factory, and one of his sons is a fighter pilot, and the other son works in the factory. And there's a defect in a part. But the father says, I have to ship it off. If I don't ship it off, we lose our contract. And I'm trying to keep this factory going for my sons. And he ships it off. And pilots die. And the son realizes what his father has done to, for the pilot. He takes a plane up and he dies. <coughs> And they get the information, you know, your son has died, and a little bit of information about him. And the father says, but I did it for my sons. And the surviving son says, he wanted you to know that, that they're, <laughs> they're all your sons. Now, the street comes up, the mice come up. We have all these exchange students from all over the world. And I see all of them. They're all my sons. They're all my daughters. They're all my children. Enough of that. Amen. Now, I've watched you with other speakers, so you all run away real quick, but I'm happy to engage in conversation and questions. No. <laughs> There's a question. Oh, yes, my buddy. How um, do we specific skill sets where we can help the different organizations work together rather than be separated and against each other. Uh, I'm just going to tell you a story, um, and that's the best way I can do it, and, and stories. I um, walked on the bike trail just a couple of days ago. And um, I've, so remember, I'm in the Republican Central Committee, but whenever they have to play with the Democrats, they send David, because David likes everybody. So. And, and the Dems like me plenty too. So, um, and this one fellow says, uh, so later, this person I would say from the progressives is calling me. I won't go into all the issues, but he mentioned one issue. And he said, and David, what is it about this one gal who's in custody and she's a person of color and she's been there for five years and she's never been charged? So he had enough relationship with me, even though in theory he's on the other side, but he's 
the human being, I don't care. Um, and so he didn't, and, he, and he asked me, and then because I don't spend all my time watching TV, but actually you know, do things, I was able to tell him her whole story. How she's loved within that, within, she's in custody, but the enemy service officers love her, because she's honored by her with a job. She's there to have her life protected, a gang wants to kill her, because she's a witness in a first degree murder. She's from another county, so our county is in charge of her, we're just detaining her. She's lucky not to be charged as an accessory to a first degree murder. We keep on trying to get her out, but we can't get her out until everything's done with a first degree murder case. So he got to hear, and he realized it's not a racial justice issue. In fact, all of the victims, the perpetrators, you know, everybody were. And, and so there was a reason. And so he got, there was communication, there was relationship. And he says, oh, okay, I get it. And I think that that's what we all need to do, is to be engaged, to be able to reach across, to not put people in a box and see the humanity of each person. So that's just an example of something that just happened within the last few days. Does that help? Yeah. 
this this all right? All right. Some narrator, remember I talked about autocracy and dictatorship and totalitarianism? That's what that stuff really is. That, I mean, they pretend it's communism. It has nothing to do with communism. It's, they're no more communist than Gaddafi was a communist. I realize that. Well, yeah. With, with the other lady that was talking about um, people having different versions of facts, I think it's actually possible for people to have different versions of, of what the truth is based on your background, how you grew up, how you take in the information that's provided to you. I mean, in, in the Bible, uh, Pontius Pilate even said, what is truth? And it's become more true now, to, and I think one of the the downsides to all the information that we have on the internet is because you can subscribe to whatever convenient truth you want to believe in. And so truth, is, I think, has become more fluid than it ever has. I've seen it change just in my short lifetime. And so and that's, it's both interesting and troubling. Yeah. I'd just like to add to that, I mean, it's just a thought I've had. The truth an event happens, something takes place. There's a back story to it, and that's what we truly don't understand. And the reason behind the event, I think that we're more concerned about, ultimately we're more concerned about that part of it rather than the event itself. We're more concerned about the back story? Is that well, you know, I think we're more concerned about, yeah, and that's more dubious. It's because it's dealing with human beings and their interactions. And we can't really know that. We don't, I think you alluded to this earlier on in your talk. I understand what you're saying, but I agree with it. Can you rephrase it? Well, I think there's so many reasons in the backstory. If someone commits a crime, well, yeah, this person committed a crime, but if we don't know what his background was, whether, or he or she was raped as a kid, or was beaten every day. And so those are, that backstory is really, I think, very important to the fact of whatever right. the action was. I, you know, I would say when we watch the news, when we get this information, we make it, that's sensationalism. And again, it's the why behind it that's really more important to understand. And we might eventually be able to deal with, again, what happened to cause that to happen. That completes the story. You have more facts. <laughs> So, David, these questions are fascinating because I just recently reread a book that gets into a lot of this in detail, the subject of facts, knowledge, and community, and the importance of community in understanding and knowledge. And the, and the book is uh, <clears throat> The Constitution of Knowledge in Defense of the Truth, and it's by Jonathan Rauch. Jonathan Rauch is a, is a fellow in the American Enterprise Institute. And I recommend that to, to get some insight into, into this, these issues of knowledge and community and the role. One of the things that he says in this book is that, that our, our biases, our individual biases, get diluted by community. Because by community, oh. that community is, I may know something, and you may know something, but the real, the real um, knowledge is that we know something. It, it's, and he explains why, why that's the case. So I, I recommend that book highly. Say it again. The book. Mm -hmm. It's the constitution of knowledge. The subtitle is In Defense of Truth, and it's by Jonathan Rauch. Okay. R-E-C-H? 
R A U C A. Hey David, uh, you're, you're a great story, but you okay, have a story about your experiences in town and the controversy over keeping or removing the noose on the Placerville City logo. <laughs> <laughs> All the people involved, what would, you, what would you say about what you uh, discussed? Well, I did have a letter um, published in the Mount Democrat. It was called, No News is Good News. <laughs> celebrate the Constitution. We should not be celebrating anarchy and chaos. And the news is due to the failure of a legal system or the absence of a legal system. And, and so why not celebrate other things like the coming of the Constitution to Blasterville instead of what happens when there is no law. And uh, so that's basically what I said, and some people liked it, some people didn't. You know. <laughs> and that, that he says, welcome to a community. So watch for some more driving in down, down the road, seeing the news. One of, one of our friends, uh, went, uh, her, their daughter went to college, and she had a black roommate that was terrified because she was from Hangtown. <laughs>
And we selected a, a book. Uh, quite a few possibilities were just discussed. But this is called CAS, C-A-S-C-E, The Origins of Our Discontents by Isabel Wilkerson. And I've heard several friends say that they read it already and really, really enjoyed it. So, okay, is that Thursday of the month? Two to four at the library. Thank you. <laughs>